Welcome back to WHDT World News. I'm Gary Franchi, and joining me now is whistleblower from the World Bank, Karen Hudes. We're going to bring you the conclusion of yesterday's interview. Karen, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Gary. Karen, when, when we when we concluded yesterday's interview, we were discussing, uh, or you you had brought up the new constitution that was instated in the United States. Are, so. Is the Constitution that we know today in effect, or is there a different Constitution that you claim? Unfortunately, we are being snookered by the Congress because every two years they reintroduce a state of martial law. And we are not under our first Constitution. We are under this second secret Constitution. What that Constitution provides is that our tax dollars are going to pay interest to the Federal Reserve. They're not paying for any of the services that we need in our country. Instead, where are we getting the money? We're getting it from the poppy fields in Afghanistan and the drug trade. That's how we're financing our country. This is a travesty. Now, you mentioned that the secret constitution allows for the interest to be paid uh, to the Federal Reserve. Uh, but isn't that the Federal Reserve Act that we know that was established in 1913 uh, when it was passed on Christmas Eve? Uh, so which, where does that law fall into place? You'll remember that uh, President Lincoln was assassinated by a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. That was in order to prevent the greenback dollars that Lincoln had issued directly by the Treasury Department. And so what happened was the bank of that day was then able to continue to earn interest on the currency of the United States. That was why he was assassinated. And the reason why we had that second constitution enacted in 1871 is that is when the Revolutionary War debts fell due. As a matter of fact, one day I opened uh, my mail and somebody mailed me the um, financing statement for those debts that, together with the unpaid interest on the debts, had accrued to the trillions of dollars. Now, the concept of a secret constitution, um, some people might cry foul there. They might, I don't believe a word you're saying because I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, how, can, how can those claims be substantiated? Two ways. The first is that I will show you the minutes of the meeting of the Patriots who met and looked at the State House records in Carolina when that secret constitution was enacted. And I can show you the financing statements for the Re Revolutionary War debt. That was the reason we got that second secret constitution. So is, it, is that second secret constitution, is it, who, who is it in favor of? Is it in favor of the people or the corporate United States? It's in favor of the banks. It's certainly not in favor of the people. What happens when you have a child is your child is given a social security number. They estimate how many taxes your child is going to pay over his or her lifetime. And they went, they take that birth certificate and they issue it on the capital markets and they earn money on it. Okay, so, so what you're saying is that the birth certificate itself creates a monetary value on the books with the Federal Reserve? I'm saying something much worse, actually. What I'm saying is that when every citizen goes into the court system, they are not seen there as themselves a U.S. citizen. They're seen as the person who had their birth certificate pledged. You're there as a debtor. You're not there as a citizen. So because of the national debt, are you saying that Americans are, are sim they're just born into debt and there's uh, nothing that they can really do about it? They're just, they're debtors in this system. We have been converted from human beings that are citizens of the Republic of the United States into chattel. Chattel, that is a legal term for something which is property. We are now considered to be property of the Federal Reserve. We're not considered to be human beings and citizens of the United States. 
That's a very strong statement. How do we reverse that? If that, if that, if that is in fact the true statement, how do we reverse that? The first thing we do is we recognize it. We understand it. And then the second thing we do is we have that constitutional convention, which is our right under our first constitution, and we repeal that banker's constitution. We repeal it, we get rid of it, we do not want it, we do not need it, and we issue our treasury dollars backed by the gold out of the collateral account that has been offered to us. Some people are very concerned about Article 5 convention, wherein you may have powers, money powers, that could inject themselves into the uh, uh, into that convention process where the Constitution is rewritten. A lot of people are very concerned that some of the very basic rights that are instilled and enshrined uh, in the Bill of Rights would then be evaporated. Uh, maybe the freedom of the press would, would be changed to only um, specific sanctioned outlets can speak freely. Uh, or even the Second Amendment would have to be rewritten uh, to only allow certain people to carry firearms uh, to protect others. Um, so there's a lot of people who do have valid concerns with an Article 5 convention. Do you share those concerns? I say that that is a very good proof to me of just how corrupted our media is. Because if we had a true media that was representing the interests of the citizens, they would know that that is not a concern whatsoever. Because what happens out of that convention is simply recommendations, which have to be voted up or down by three quarters of the state legislatures. You you think, do you, but do you think the money powers would have enough lobbying capacity to lobby for those three quarters of the states? I mean, if you think back to when the 16th Amendment was, 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 uh, was passed, even though it was passed illegally and it wasn't properly ratified by three-fourths of states, it still became an amendment and we are now are under an income tax system. Uh, so if you think about three-quarters of the states ratifying uh, an Article 5 um, convention, do you believe that the money powers could have influence in that process? I would simply ask your viewers to take a good look at whether we have a second secret constitution, how we got that constitution, and whether we in the United States have the wherewithal to throw off those shackles. And if we don't, we deserve them. So where is the second constitution? Where is it? Where do, where do they keep it? What does it say? It, the second constitution consists of the fact that we are paying interest on our debt when we could simply have clean treasury dollars backed by gold. Is it a constitution in the same sense that we understand our constitution as today? Now, when I think of the constitution, I think of old parchment and, and handwritten script, and I, and I think of um, you know, the founding fathers and writing this document out. So when I think of a second constitution, that's, is, is, it, is it fair to say that these, is this another document that written in the same manner, or is it, um, I don't know, help, help me visualize what this document, what this document says. What it is, is it's the act of 1871, where Maryland and Virginia created this square mile of the District of Columbia, and then they incorporated the United States as a company, and they made the President of the United States the chief executive officer, and they made the representatives of Congress managers. And so when people come to Congress, they're, they're taught very quickly that their constituents are not what it's all about. What it's all about is for them to get on the dole of the, the federal government, which is there to um, enslave the people who live in the United States. That's what that is. So, so, the, so is it fair to call it a constitution then, or is it, is it more or less when, the, when, when Maryland and Virginia created Washington, D.C. as its own district of Columbia as we know it today? Well, it's, it's more than that, because the um, federal courts, the judges, 
are not sitting there in courts of equity. They're secretly treating us as if we are property of the United States. When we come in there, we are not there in a court of equity. So yes, it is, it is a different arrangement with our government. The, the secret constitution, is it really more of a corporate document? What it means is that when you go to court to protect your rights, you don't even get to first base because that judge is not sitting in what you call a court of equity. They're not looking at you as if you're a citizen of the United States. They're handling you as if you're a person who's just servicing the debt of the United States. You're there as a thing. So if you're just a thing in a courtroom that's servicing debt, um, I mean, what, what does that make every American citizen? It takes away all of our rights. So Americans don't have any rights. Americans need to take back their rights because our founding fathers were very clear about that. We were in a country that had consent of the governed. We were in a country that could bear arms, had the right to bear arms. They understood that we were a liberty-loving people. And actually, the fate of the world is riding on whether we have remained that. And I think we have. So what do you see as the future of this nation? I know that yesterday we spoke about um, that you're very optimistic about the, 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 the global outlook. Um, and there are other individuals who believe that we're on the precipice of a global economic collapse. Um, given, given this constitution that you speak of and the state of, of the rights of Americans, um, where, do we, where do we go from here? Where we go from here is that we just um, take a deep breath and thank ourselves for our neighbors and our friends and our country and our founding fathers that gave us the first constitution, which is protecting not only our rights, but the rights of every human being on this earth. And all that we have to do is say yes to the dollar that John F. Kennedy printed for us and tell the bankers that they're not entitled to keep it from us. It's our birthright. And the gold that belongs to us because Wolfgang Strzok has allocated it to us. And when we, when we say yes to that, it's really not that hard to say yes, it seems to me. Um, what we're doing is we're freeing that gold also for the rest of humanity so all the other countries of, of the world get their share of the assets. And we just rebuild. And what that would look like is up to us. It's going to be our world to take back and um, to care for each other. Some people might disagree with you and, and say that the Constitution has failed us, that the, the Constitution that the Founding Fathers has, has failed us because we are seeing a Congress pass laws that are contrary to it with, with no um, uh, with, with, with no repercussion. Uh, we see a commander-in-chief uh, enforcing laws that are contrary to the very document they take an oath to. So has the, has the Constitution, the original Constitution that the founders created, uh, has it failed the American people in that regard? I think... Um, or, 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 has it, or is it just a failure of humanity or a failure of, of leadership um, in, what do you think? Let me explain where we are. I think when people understand where we are, they'll see that um, we only have ourselves to thank for whatever the outcome is going to be, because we are actually at a fork in the road. And um, I'm working together with whistleblowers, first of all, from the World Bank. That's who I started out working with. And then I started working with anybody as my story and the rest of the whistleblower story got out. And once Elaine Colville, who's um, in Scotland, she's a World Bank whistleblower, the two of us got our statement up on the UK Parliament website. What was our statement? The first statement I got up was that the capital markets are absolutely um, 
mon they're just completely controlled by this um, conglomerate that has 40% of the assets and 60% of the earnings of all the companies that are traded. And the Securities and Exchange Commission is not enforcing insider trading laws. And the Securities and Exchange Commission was not requiring KPMG to do an honest audit of the World Bank financial statements because I bought a World Bank bond, which meant that I was a bondholder and the World Bank was not immune. So I went to the um, serious fraud office in the United Kingdom and I told the serious fraud office that it was their responsibility since the UK was also helping to finance the World Bank and also because UK citizens owned World Bank bonds. It was their responsibility to end this corruption that I was reporting. So the serious fraud office called up the Securities and Exchange Commission. That was in 2010. The SEC couldn't be bothered. The same people at the SEC that brought us Bernie Madoff wouldn't answer the serious fraud office. So then when the uh, UK Parliament asked a question about supervision of the UK money in the World Bank, I answered that question. I said there was no supervision, that the UK taxpayer money was just going to the dogs at the World Bank. And then there was a second question, which was on privatization. They wanted to know in the UK Parliament whether um, the functions of the UK public um, ought to be privatized. And I said, absolutely not, because the entity that was supposed to be supervising the World Bank for the, on behalf of the UK had been privatized, and they were doing a lousy job. And then the third question was, how is the UK Parliament and the rest of the UK government doing on processing complaints? And I said, you're doing a lousy job. I've been complaining to the Parliament for years, and you're just sitting on your hands. And Elaine Colville... Um, gave a much more blunt um, criticism because she had been going to the prime minister and the ombudsman, and uh, she just took, the, she raked them over the coals. You can see our statements up on so, Parliament. So, so then, back to the to the question: Does does that mean that you see a failure in the American leadership to uphold the values of the Constitution, or? You know, because there, there's, there are people out there that, that say, you know, we have this great document and it, it stands for so much and it's brought us so far, but we have people who are in power uh, who disregard it and simply pay it lip service. So, um, where, where do you stand on that, on that position? Well, I have been um, going to the uh, U.S. Congress and writing to them and talking to them, and I've been talking, for example, to General Martin Dempsey on December 2nd when he had a town hall meeting, I've been discussing the problem one-on-one -on -one when uh, the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, was a senator. I spoke to him about this power transition model that we were discussing, which is very accurate, which said that we were at a fork in the road and that if we would lose our allies, we would have a currency war. And they know very well how that model works because they've been working on it in the Department of Defense and how very accurate it is. So um, what can I say? They are completely aware of the fact that we are at the fork in the road and why I think we're going to take the high road is because they know enough citizens are also aware of this model and they're demanding of their government that we take the high road. They're not letting them off the hook. They're writing their Congress people. And for example, there was um, a meeting of, you know, I've been, I've been at this business of whistleblowing and I've been getting public um, coverage now for quite some time, although not with the mainstream media. You won't find the first interview on the mainstream media. So going back to one of your questions about RTTV, when RTTV did have me on, this is not a little story. Where did you find this in the mainstream media? So, um, no, we're, we're not, um, I guess the, the answer is you get the government you deserve. There's something called the National Taxpayer Union. They have a blog up on me. I've had a number of people writing their Congress people, and I was going to start talking about the county executives because um, there was a meeting of county executives in July. And what happened was um, one of the um, people that just write, writes to me based on 
some of the uh, news coverage that I'm getting with HDTV and also with um, the stories on the alternative media. So they contacted me and they said, you know, Karen, you can't just keep going to the governors. You have got to go to something else because the governors are not um, responding. So that's when I started writing to an organization of county executives. And they had a meeting in July and they elected Ike Leggett, who is the county executive of Montgomery County, Maryland, which is the county that I live in. And so I have been um, keeping Ike Leggett informed. I've been keeping, and I've been asking all of the people that contact me to contact their county executives as well. So what I would say is that we have um, a very um, intricate but powerful system in our republic that does have all of the bells and whistles necessary. And we will be able to take back our republic. I'm very optimistic that the machinery will work. But I'm also not underestimating the amount of the cleanup job because I would, I would, um, I've been, as a lawyer, I've been going to the American Bar Association. I would have to say that the legal profession is seriously, seriously broken, that the bar associations should not be responsible for licensing attorneys because they have not been responsive. I say that that system is totally broken. Karen, we're just about out of time, and I want to give you another opportunity to um, you know, g g give your final thoughts to the American people um, on the state of, of America and the state of the world and uh, the, the, the practical things that the individuals can do to, uh, to, to make change happen for humanity. Well, the very first thing I would say is go out and buy silver and gold coins because we still have Federal Reserve notes and those pieces of paper um, are toilet paper. That is the very first thing that you should do because you do not want your family not to have currency and what you currently have is not worth anything. That's why the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are no longer paying for their international trade in dollars Governments are no longer holding the Federal Reserve notes. We need to be very, un we, you need to do your homework as citizens and find out what it means when you have Federal Reserve notes. They are valueless and they are unconstitutional and we need to get that outfit out of here. That's the very first thing. And then the second thing is that we have to, um, we have to all um, work together to clean up the mess. And I don't think it's going to be that hard, actually, to, um, to get our republic back. 